Also, I found out how, why our praise and worship team was so anointed this morning. They've been breaking bread this morning. Y'all see this? It's on the stage. A whole box of it. So if anybody wants a few, there's a few left. Here you go, J.D. You can pass those out. I'm telling you, that's some powerful bread right there. I've been breaking. So honored to be here with this morning. Pastor Jeff will be here next week, but I get to bring the word to you. I'm his wife. And we've been married for 32 years. Coming up in December, that's seven Hollywood marriages. That's pretty good. And my mom and dad are here this morning. Stand up, Mama and Papa. Just call them Mama and Papa Dunn. They moved this way. They're here with us. So let's praise the Lord for that. All right. Turn in your Bibles to Psalms 121. Pastor Jeff and I started a series called Dependence on God. And in the middle of that series, Pastor Jeff is going to be preaching on healing. And I believe that people are going to be healed as he preaches this short series on healing. In fact, he prayed for me Wednesday night. I had this horrible headache that started coming on me uh, where I would usually get it and it would stay there for a while. He said, I'm telling you, Eileen, I'm anointed. I'm going to pray for you. You're going to be healed. And I said, okay, I believe it. And he laid hands on me. I'm telling you, the headache left me. And I preached that night. That was Wednesday night. I'm glad you're preaching on healing, Pastor Jeff. I believe that some people are going to be walking in divine health and new levels of health and healing. Amen? Amen. Psalms 121. David said these words. He said, I will lift up my eyes to the hill from where my help comes from. It comes from God. David put his dependence on God. He said, I'm looking to God for my help who made heaven and earth. He will not allow my foot to be moved. He who keeps me, he will not slumber. God never slumbers from keeping you. He's always working on your behalf. The Lord that keeps Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps, the Bible said. He is your keeper. And then it goes on to say that he is a cover over your right hand. You know your right hand is your right hand of authority and that Jesus Christ bought you the, your authority through Christ, it comes through Christ, and he is the keeper of that. You can walk in authority while you live on this earth because of what Jesus did for us. Amen? He's the head of the church. We're the body, and the enemy is under our feet. You got a, a, if you've got a, a, some kind of something you want to say to the enemy, if you've got a message for the enemy, just write it on the bottom of your foot as what a preacher said because that's where he is, is he's under your feet. And so the Bible says that he's a shade over your right hand, that the sun won't smite you by day, neither the moon by night. And it goes on to say that he will keep you from all evil. God is your keeper from now until evermore. And so this morning I want to preach a sermon uh, called God will do what he said he would do and he will do over and above. We serve just that kind of God. He's your keeper he will keep you, and he will do over and above. In John chapter 6, the multitude came to Jesus. They were following him. They were listening to his teachings, and he was healing them. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. And so Jesus put his dependence on God. He listened to God, and he walked in the power of God. And he demonstrates to us how you can put your dependence on God, and he will not just meet your need, but he will exceed the need and do over and above. We have serving over and above God. All these people were following Jesus. He was teaching them. It was a multitude that was there. There were 5,000 men plus women and children. They say there was about 20,000 people there. And so Jesus says, they're hungry, we need to feed them. So he sends the disciples to go find out how much money they had. Philip shows up and says, we have 200 penny worth. And he says, it's really not even enough that everyone could just take a little. Notice how man thinks, man thinks little. And so Jesus says, notice how Jesus thinks though. Jesus says, Jesus takes the offering and he doesn't just think about the little. He takes the, the little that they found, or they found two fishes and five loaves. And so Jesus doesn't think little. What Jesus does is he blesses God for what they have. He blesses God that they only have 200 penny worth or that they only have two fishes and five loaves. He lifts it up to heaven, and he doesn't complain about what he has. 
No, he doesn't look at what he doesn't have. He takes what he has. It's important for us to do this. If we're going to put our dependence on God and expect God to do the over and above like he, like he so well wants to do for you, then you and I need to do what Jesus did, and we need to lift up what we have and bless him for what we have. And so Jesus did that. He's teaching us. He's demonstrating to us how to walk in the over and above, how to trust God and put your dependence on him when you don't have enough. And so he lifts it up and he blesses it. And he thanks God for the two fish and five loaves that are going to feed the 20,000. And when he does that, it multiplies. When you take what you have, you don't complain about it. You don't say, oh, God, well, I wish I had this or that. No, you thank God for what you have. God will multiply what you have. He's that kind of God. And so he lifted it up, blessed him. He multiplied it. And the Bible says they all ate, all 20,000 of them ate. And it says they were filled. Have you ever been filled before? I mean, filled to where you are, you're in pain. Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner. Mama, my mom, she cooked some amazing roast and gravy and, and mashed potatoes. And I'm telling you, every year I would hurt myself. Or every time she made it, she made it often. Because we didn't go out to eat that often. And so Mama cooked a lot. In fact, when she would cook her amazing pinto beans and cornbread, I really hurt myself then too. You just need to taste Mama's food. And you'll really be living. And so Jesus, he filled them all. And, and, uh, but, but this is what he did. Wow. God just didn't meet their need. He just didn't fill them up. The thousands of thousands of people weren't just full. No, in verse 13, chapter 6, verse 13, it says, They gathered 12 baskets and five barleys, and they, that remained over and above. If God would have just met their need, that would have been good enough. But no, he's an over and above God. And so he says, gather up the leftovers. There are leftovers. There's more than enough. There's overflowing. And that's the kind of God we serve. And I want to build your faith this morning that to put your dependence on God and that he will meet your need. And not only that, but he will do over and above for you, just like he did for Jesus when they were in need. In John 21, Jesus is at the seashore, and, and the disciples are out fishing, and Jesus shows up there, and they had been fishing all night, and they had caught nothing. Have you ever done that, worked and worked and worked, and ended up with nothing? Well, that's where they were at, and worked hard and told all night, and Jesus hollers to them from the seashore. He says, little children, do you have anything to eat? And one of the disciples noticed, hey, I think that's Jesus. Peter jumps in the water and starts swimming to him. And he says, he says, throw your nets on the other side. And this is when they decided to put their dependence on God. I'm going to do what God said. I'm going to put my dependence on him. They threw their net on the other side. And the Bible says there were so many fish that their nets were so full that they weren't able to draw them in because of the multitude. The Bible says in verse 8, they were dragging their nets to the seashore because God did not just meet their need and give them something to eat for the moment. He did over and above because he's that kind of God. And God's saying to us, I just don't want to meet your need. No, I want to do over and above for you in your life because I'm in Ephesians 3.20, God. I'm going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can even ask or think. Our dependence is on him and I'm looking to him, and I believe that he can do what he said he would do. There's a great, great illustration in the Old Testament of Naomi and Ruth. They were in a famine. They'd really gone through a rough time and lost everything. Their, both their husbands had died. They were left with nothing. Even the provision they needed for life for the future, their husbands, the workers who would provide for them, they were gone. So Naomi and Ruth decide we're going to put our dependence on God, and they do it by an act of going back to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is where they would put their dependence on God. They go back to Naomi's homeland. It's the place, the house of bread is what Bethlehem is called, the place of provision where God would provide for them. Here they are alone, down to nothing, 
And so what they do is they go back to Bethlehem. You see, there's an advantage in a Hebrew custom that they could take advantage of. And uh, it actually was a Hebrew law that Moses had said whenever there was a famine that if there were poor people that could not eat, it didn't have enough to eat, anything to eat, they could go behind the reapers when they were harvesting and they could get scraps and leftovers and get the meager, meager provisions that were, that were left behind, that the law provided. And so the reapers would reap the harvest and the leftovers. If there was anything left on the ground, those who were impoverished and poor could go pick it up. So Naomi and Ruth make it back to Bethlehem to the house of bread. And Ruth goes out into the field because Naomi's older and she stays back. And she starts picking up the scraps and the leftovers that are out of the field that the law provided. So, But remember, Ruth was a Gentile. And so she didn't really have a right to be out in the field. She was a Gentile. She did not, uh, uh, was even worthy of the full blessing. And, uh, and so she still went out in the field and really had no business being out there, but went out there anyway. So she goes out in the field, she gets on her knees, and she starts picking up, you know, little uh, leftovers, maybe a half a stalk of cabbage or uh, some wheat, and, and she picks up just a little food here and there. And at the end of her doing that all day long, working so hard, she takes her little bowl that's probably half full. And the reason we believe that she didn't have much left over is because the Bible said that those reapers in those days were sure-handed. That means they were professional reapers. They weren't about to leave anything behind. No, they did what they did, and they did it well. They had it down. They were really good at what they did, so they didn't drop hardly anything. They didn't leave anything behind, hardly. And so they didn't want the peasants to come get it before they can come back and pick it up later on and take their harvest because they had to produce a big harvest. Well, here she was down getting scraps and getting her, her meager portion to take back to Naomi so they could have just enough to barely get by. She put her dependence on God. And when you put your dependence on God, I'm telling you what, Jesus will show up. God will show up. Boaz rides up. He's our type and shadow of Jesus today. In other words, grace rode up. Jesus is grace. He's God's riches at Christ's expense for you and I. And so where the law only gave us a meager portion, when grace rode up, man, grace supplied great portions for us over and above and overflowing. And so here Ruth is out in the field, and Boaz notices her because she put her dependence on God. Same way with you and I. We're out in the field working, and I'm telling you, when you put your dependence on him, Jesus notices, and he rides up, and, and he tells the harvesters something ridiculous. He tells them, he says, I want you to drop the harvest purposefully. Drop handfuls for her. Just start throwing down blessings right and left so that she can enjoy these blessings. In other words, get sloppy, get bad at your work, drop it on purpose. But don't tell her, I don't want her to feel humiliated. I don't want her to feel embarrassed. Don't tell her, but drop these handfuls everywhere for her. And just fake it and just drop them. So you can only imagine the law only provided a little bit, but here she is, a Gentile girl. She's out in a Hebrew field putting her faith in God. Boaz shows up, a type of Jesus. Grace shows up, and now she has to get a big sack to get all her blessings that she's taken up from the field. I mean, she's filling that sack up. She can barely carry the sack home and saying, Naomi, look what happened out in the field today. We put our dependence on God, and he's just not meeting our daily needs. No, he's doing more than enough over and above, exceedingly abundantly, more than we can even ask or think. Wow, it's crazy, but it started happening. My gosh, we serve a God like that. We serve a God who is a, our heavenly Boaz, Jesus, who has given us the new covenant, 
Because under the law, the meager provision that the law provided was, was if you sinned, you would take an animal and you would slay it. And that animal that you slayed would cover your sin. And it only covered your sin, and, and, and that sin had to be rolled over till the next year, till the Day of Atonement. And the next year, it was rolled over. It was just covered. It was a promissory note that one day I would come and I would wash all your sins away. But that sin was only covered and it was rolled over and rolled over and rolled over. But still, it was still just covered and still there. But then our heavenly Boaz, Jesus Christ, comes and he says, I'm going to bleed for you. And I'm going to give you a new covenant. And I'm just not going to cover your sins. I will just not atone for your sins no, but I will wash them completely away, and I will do away with them. Psalms 103 verse 12 says, He will cast them as far as the east is from the west. He will remove your sins from you. If you go north, you'll get to the North Pole. After you get there, you have to go south to get to the South Pole. And then if you want to go to the North Pole again, you got to travel north. But if you leave a spot... That's, and you decide you're going to go west, and you travel west, then you'll never get to east. You may hit your spot again. You'll keep hitting it, but you will never get to east. And whenever God washes your sins away and casts them as far as the east is from the west, you will never get to that sin again. He never will get to that sin again. No, it's washed and cast away as far as the east is from the west. He's not going to bring it back up. It's not going to happen. No, he, the Bible says that he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12, he remembers it no more. What a wonderful thing. But that's not all he did. He's done over and above because we serve an over and above God. The Bible says if the blood of bulls and goats can sanctify them that then how much more, the writer says, shall the blood of Jesus purge your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? You and I can be free from shame. We can be free from guilt. We can be free from condemnation, the things that keep us from the provision God has for us. Jesus has provision for you. And Romans 8 and 1 says that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You don't want to walk after the law anymore. No, you want to walk in the spirit of forgiveness that God has already purchased for you. And when you do that, you will enjoy God's more than enough, over and above blessings that he has that he's pouring out in your life. When I learned this truth, it changed my life. I was a I, it just changed everything about my life. I started believing God for things. I started coming boldly to the throne of grace, and I started having faith in the blood of Jesus and faith in my God. I remember whenever I first got on fire for God, I would think, how do people worship God like that? That is amazing. They just lift up their hands just boldly, and I've done some things wrong. And God had to give me a revelation on his blood how real his blood was, how I can then raise my hands and sing like everyone else and sing, I am the righteousness of God created in his image for his glory. I am the righteousness of God created in his image for his glory. A vessel made unto honor Set apart to do his will. No more walking in the darkness. I am risen to a new life. By his power I will live. And so God is saying that to you today. Will you walk in my righteousness and enjoy the provision of my blood that was already shed for you and put faith in the blood so you don't walk in condemnation, so you don't wake up the next morning and say, well, I can't have it. I just wasn't good enough. I kicked the dog and got mad at the dog. Can't have it today. I'm not going to ask Jesus for anything today. No, anything you get from him is because of what he did for you anyway. He provided for it for you. You just wake up every morning saying, thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus. 
I just wash me clean. Anything I have done wrong, I thank you, Father, for forgiving me for that. And I thank you, Father, that I will walk on your road in your righteousness. Of course, I mean, you don't just do things wrong and, and do them wrong on purpose. No, you do. When you do things wrong, you, you fall and you mess up. But you're on the road doing the right thing. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise for his blood that was shed for us on Calvary. And then in 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a widow woman. She's in debt. And she can't pay off her debt. The creditors are coming to take her sons to enslave them. And, um, and so she's pretty much going under. And her sons are the next generation's being taken away from her. But this little woman decides she's going to put her dependence on God. And God sends a message to the prophet, and he says, take the little bit you have left. You don't have much left. But just take that little bit you have left. Go out and borrow some vessels, as many as you can from the neighbors. Bring it in, and I want you to pour the oil. She put her dependence on God. She simply obeyed God. Simple obedience brings supernatural results. And so she... God sent her a message through the prophet, and she started pouring oil into the vessels, and the oil kept flowing and flowing and flowing. And the Bible says there was enough oil for her to pay her debt off. God did a miracle for her, but he didn't stop there. God didn't just do a miracle. No, he's an over and above God. He not only did a miracle for her where she paid off her debt, the Bible says not only do you have enough now to pay off your debt, but to live on the rest for the rest of your life. She had enough oil to live for the rest of her life. And I'll tell you this morning, God told me to come over here and tell you that he's that kind of God that's going to bring you out of debt. How many of you are believing God to bring you out of debt? Yes. Just lift up a hand to heaven. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, that you're bringing your people out of debt in Jesus' name. Not only did he bring her out of debt, but he did over and above more than enough, and that's the kind of God we serve. He is God Almighty. He is the beginning and the end. He is the chief shepherd that you can follow. He is the counselor. He will counsel us. He will show us the way. He is the eternal one. He is the first fruits and firstborn. He is the friend of all sinners. He is God with us always and in us. He is God, our teacher, who will teach us and give us wisdom and truth for life. He is the great high priest. He is the head of the church. He is the heir of all things, and you and I are a joint heir with him of all things. He is our hope of glory. He is the I am that I am. What do you need? He is that. Whatever you need in life, he is that. He is I am. He is the judge of the living and the dead. He is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. He is our light, and he shines his light so we can walk on the right path. He is our life. He is the living stone. He is the mediator for us of a new and better covenant. He he is the overcoming lamb. He is the omnipotent God, the all-powerful God. He can move. He can give you his power and life so you can live an abundant life. He is the Passover. He is our peace. He is the prince of God. He is our redeemer. He is our ransom. He is the star of Jacob, the son of man, and the son of God. He's the true vine. If we will put our branch in him, we can bear fruit. He is the tree of life, the unspeakable gift of God. He is our victor. We will overcome in Jesus' name. Yes, he is the voice of God. He is the very Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the word. He is wonderful. He's Adam's creator. He's Noah's ark of safety. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Isaac's substitute. He's Jacob's wrestler. He's Moses' staff. He's Aaron's rod that budded. He's Samson's strength. He's David's slingshot. Yes, that shot down and knocked down the giants that were in front of him. 
He's Deborah's song. He's Solomon's wisdom. He's Elijah's mantle. And he's Elisha's double portion. There's a double portion coming in Jesus' name. Yes, yes. He is Isaiah's righteous servant. He's Jeremiah's righteous branch. He is Ezekiel's man of fire. He's Daniel's ancient of days. He is over and above all. He is Jesus. He is God, our Savior. He's the faithful husband. He's Jacob's restorer of the wasted years. I feel this. God is going to restore your wasted years. He's going to restore them in Jesus' name. He's Malachi's day star from on high. He's Matthew's Messiah. He's Mark's miracle worker. How many of you believe in God for a miracle? In Jesus' name, he's Luke's son of man. He's John's son of God. He's Peter's rock, and he's the keys to the kingdom. He's Paul's potter, and he is has power over the clay over us. He's uh, In Revelation, he's the one who was dead, and he is alive. And he has made king over death, and he is made king over over hell. I want you to know this morning that he's above everything. He's he's so high that you can't even lift him any higher. And he's below everything. He's so low you can't go he, he doesn't go any lower. He goes as far as you need him to go. He can reach down into the mud and mire and pick you up and set your feet on a rock. He is inside everything, so don't try and lock him out because you can't. And he's outside everything, so you can't put him out. He's Jehovah Shammah, our fellowship. He's Jehovah Shalom. He is my peace. I can have peace no matter what's going on around me. Yes, I can. He is Jehovah Nisi, our conqueror. He is Jehovah Sikanu, our righteousness. Yes, he is. He's Jehovah Rapha. He is my healer. Let's stand up this morning. How many of you need healing in your body? He is Jehovah Rapha. He is your healer. Just lift your hands up to him. He is everything. We put our dependence on him. On you, Lord, we depend and we trust in you. You are our healer and, healer, and you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. I thank you, Lord, for providing everything that's needed. We trust you. We put our dependence on you. We put our faith foot forward and we say, God, we know that we can trust in you and that you will do it. And we stay steady in you, Lord, steady on the rock. Oh, Father, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord. You are our solid rock. You are Christ, the rock, our foundation. And we put our trust and hope in you, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you're going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. And that's just how you are, God. We thank you, Lord, that we can put our dependence on you. You created us, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that you have us in your hands. And I thank you, Lord, that nothing can pluck us out of your hands. I thank you, Lord, for safety. I thank you, Lord, for peace. I thank you, Lord, that you lead and guide your people. I thank you, Lord, you are our shepherd and we shall not want. You make us to have peace and lie down in green pastures. You lead us beside the still waters. You restore our soul. You redeem our life, Father, from destruction. You crown us with loving kindness and tender mercy. You satisfy our mouth with good things so that, Father, our youth is renewed like the eagles. We trust you. We put our faith and hope in the over and above God. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for moving, for touching for restoring 